Welcome to Anchors of Truth, live from the 3ABN Worship Center, the Sanctuary Series with John Bradshaw. Well, this is our last in the series on the Sanctuary with John Bradshaw, and we have really been blessed. We just feel that the Lord has been abundantly present in our midst, and we have felt the power of the Holy Spirit, and uh, we just really have enjoyed, spiritually enjoyed, uh, these messages that we have been receiving. And uh, this afternoon, the final uh, subject is called finality, and that is a fitting subject for Pastor John Bradshaw, who is the speaker director of It Is Written uh, for him to finish this series with the word finality. And uh, we're looking forward to listening and to learning and to being inspired by the Spirit of God. Before we do, I'm going to invite Pastor C.A. Murray to come. Going to ask him if he would to sing for us. And that song we're going to invite him to sing, Is It Any Wonder? think how Jesus loves me, how he waited patiently, even when I turned my back and walked away, when he knew I wanted everything this world could offer me, then I guess he knew the price I'd have to pay. So he watched me stumble downward, saw each compromise I made, heard each lie I whispered just to get my way. Still he waited there to hear me when I cried to him and prayed. Then he saved my soul and that is why I say, tell me, is it any wonder that I love him when you consider all he's done for me? And is it any wonder that I long to do his will? Let his light shine out for all to see. And is it any wonder that I praise him each time I think of how he's made me free? And is it any wonder that I've given him my heart when Jesus freely gave his life for me. When I think how Jesus loved me, how he waited patiently, how his arms are stretched to meet me when I run. When I'm feeling down and lonely, how he's there to comfort me. In the darkness he becomes my morning sun. When I think of how he's healed me, how he's touched me in my pain how his gentle hands have wiped my tears away how he's taken every heartache and brought happiness again oh i want the world to hear me when i say tell me is it any 
wonder that I love him when you consider all he's done for me and is it any wonder that I long to do his will and let his light shine out for all to see and is it any wonder that I praise him each time I think of how he's made me free and is it any wonder that I've given him my heart when Jesus freely gave his life for me. Thank the Lord. Good afternoon, everyone. I have the blessed challenge of speaking to a group of people who have just eaten. <laughs> I think we're going to be okay, though. I think we're going to be all right. You know, the sanctuary subject is, is just a, a, a mile deep. And uh, you, you might have noticed that I'm taking a, a broad look at it. I'm not looking at it with a microscope, more like a telescope. And uh, I, 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 think, I think that's okay. Um, there are themes surrounding the sanctuary, the existence of the earthly sanctuary, and then the reality of the heavenly sanctuary that it would do us well to grasp, just grab a hold of, and understand that there is a God who is keenly involved, actively involved. Um, I want to say desperately involved, but I don't know if I would use that word in relationship to God, but, but, but strongly involved and um, employed in doing everything he can for our salvation. Uh, there are verses in the Bible that tell us wonderful things about God. God is not willing that any should perish, which is not to say that none will perish, but it is, it is in the heart of God that everybody without fail would be would be saved if only they would be well let us pray and ask that as we look at uh, number five in our anchors of truth series on the sanctuary finality that God will bless us once again let's pray together our father in heaven we are thankful that we can be in your presence Today, we come to you now in the name of Jesus, your Son and our Savior. We are grateful that you have given us light. We are thankful that you have given us your sacred word. Lord, I recognize that not a soul has been saved by the gospel story. A story can't save anyone. Yet, we may and must be saved by the gospel reality. Let the good news be real in our hearts. I pray that the Christ of the Bible would not only live in the Bible, but he would live in our hearts and lives today, even at this very moment. So bless us, please, we ask, not selfishly. We pray, bless us, that you be glorified. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I was surprised to learn one day that World War II began in 1941. It came as a surprise to me. Where I'm from, World War II began in 1939. And then it dragged on and dragged on and dragged on and dragged on. Just why World War II began, we'd have to take a series just to discuss the genesis of World War II. Many complicating factors, but the point was hostilities began and by the time it was done more than do you know how many people more than 60 million people had died 
the most reliable estimates that I can find say that between 62 and 78 million people died in World War II. Those are not all combat deaths, military deaths. A number of those are civilian deaths. Many millions of those are people who died in the Holocaust. But up to 70 some million, close to 80 people by some estimates died in World War II. You know Poland lost about 17% of its population in that one great conflict. Isn't that remarkable? I wasn't alive then and I don't think I'm sorry about that. What an unfathomable thing. I mean I don't think I'm sorry I wasn't alive there. I certainly wouldn't want to be misunderstood. Experts say there were about 24 million deaths in what was at the time the Soviet Union. How do you get your mind around that? 24 million deaths. But it seems that even all bad things must come to an end. May the 8th or May 7th, it varied depending on where you were. Special day was celebrated. VE Day. Victory in Europe Day. And it was then that victory was declared in Europe for the Allies. Finally, the war in Europe was over. It dragged on for an interminably long time. Six years. That's, I mean, how long is that when it's a matter of life and death and war day in and day out? That's forever. But then it was over. August 28, 1945 in Japan officially surrendered and there was that special signing ceremony on board the USS Missouri. And where there had been war, now there was peace. Finally, it was all over. Now, you know what's interesting is that some of the combatants in World War II didn't find out it was over until well after it was over. These were, and I'm thinking of Japanese soldiers who were on... Uh, uh, pretty well deserted islands in the South Pacific, some of them were discovered into the 1970s, still hiding out there, still ready to die for their nation and defend their nation. Word hadn't got to them that the war was over. And so they just carried on under the assumption that the war was carrying right on. I wish I could say that when those uh, papers were signed on the USS Missouri, that was the end of all war, but it wasn't, was it? It wasn't very long. And then there was the Korean conflict and then Vietnam and then, of course, war in the Middle East and in Africa and in other parts of Europe. It just doesn't seem to want to end. But today, we have good news. Let's take our Bibles and open them to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 and we'll look in verse 7. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. We're in God's last day book of the Bible. And we read in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7 that there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. War in heaven. You could hardly imagine that, could you? Heaven is about perfection and holiness and everything is right everything is just how it's supposed to be and yet there was war there we can't really explain it can we we've read the passages in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28 talking about how pride was found in Lucifer how he was full of his own self and consumed with the idea of his beauty finally he said I will I want to sit in God's throne I will be like the Most High but it doesn't explain it does it how do you get from there to there? But however you get there, he got there. And there was war in heaven. And then it wasn't long and that war up there was transferred down here. And this sad, tragic earth became the theater of the most remarkable conflict in the history of the cosmos. But just like there was VEDE Day, and I think there was a VJ day, just like World War II came to an end, there is good news if we turn just a few pages over in the book of Revelation to Revelation chapter 19, and we're going to look in verse 1. No, we're not. We are going to look in verse 
11. That's like one, isn't it? <laughs> Revelation 19, verse 11. The Bible says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he, and that is Christ, that sat upon him, was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. This is Christ. When he returns in the clouds of heaven, when he comes to put down the foes of God and finally put an end to the conflict raging here on planet earth. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes his sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. There's something that buoys us up as we travel through this world. And that is we know how the story ends. We know that ultimately God triumphs. It's good news as we look ahead because Jesus comes back in the clouds of heaven. We will look up one day. The heavens will depart as a scroll and here will come Jesus riding on that symbolic white horse and he's coming back to gather up the waiting saints and he'll take us to be with him forever and ever. And we can say as did the, the songwriter, hallelujah, hallelujah. We've got confidence today. That God is going to end this warfare. We read in the book of Revelation that the former things are passed away. This is what the sanctuary service shows us. Now David writing in the Psalms, he wrote some interesting things, didn't he? He wrote some, some very beautiful, sublimely tender things. And then he wrote some, some lines that were, I mean, they were hard-edged. And he wrote some very plaintive things. He cried out to God out of his desperation. In Psalm 77, uh, David cried out, uh, Psalm 73, I beg your pardon. He said, God, the ungodly seem to prosper. He, he was honest enough to voice his concern that maybe he had cleansed his heart in vain. As he thought, he said, this is all too painful for me. And then he said, and then I went into the sanctuary of God and it was there that I understood their end. When he looked into the sanctuary, he understood how the plan of salvation was going to play out. He understood that in the end, God wins. In the end, the wicked who seem to prosper don't. And it's not that we take any kind of joy in the idea that the wicked don't prosper in the end. You know what I mean by that. You get these hateful Christians. Who, who, who want all these wicked folks to be lost and consigning them to the flames of hell. And that's not God. We talked just a few moments ago. God wants all. He wishes that all would come to repentance. God has a heart of redemption towards everybody there is and everybody there ever will be. He would that everybody be saved. David cried out, couldn't figure out how the righteous seemed to suffer, how the ungodly seemed to prosper, but he looked into the sanctuary, he considered the sanctuary services, and he realized that God makes it clear that at the end of this whole thing, Christ triumphs. The righteous triumph. You know, we as Christians shouldn't expect the ball to bounce our way in this world. We really shouldn't. Whether we are sick or whether we are well, whether we are rich or whether we are poor, whether we are popular or whether we are unpopular, it really doesn't matter. Whether we get the job of our dreams or whether we get fired, whether we end up earning a million dollars or in the unemployment line, what matters is that wherever we are, we are faithful to God and we trust God. God and we represent God as Christians and believers committed to him not out for the loaves and the fishes is God faithful yes or no sure he's faithful is he always faithful interesting thing isn't it Peter goes to jail and while he's in jail an angel comes wakes him up he said let's go Put your sandals on. Time for us to get out of here. And they just walked right out of the jail. And Peter went to the house and he banged on the door and out came Rhoda. This was very funny. And Peter said, it's me. And she said, what? And turned around and ran, left him out in the street. Now there's something crazy going on out there, Rhoda saying, and Peter's banging on the door. I mean, you just had to be there, I think. 
On the other hand, James goes to jail. They cut off his head. And he's dead. Well, well you would be, wouldn't you? Was God right in one case and wrong in another? Was God good in one case and bad in another? Was God fair in one case and unjust in another? No, God allowed the right thing to happen in both cases. Now that's easy for me to say. Nobody ever decapitated me. But the truth of the matter is we don't trust God based on appearances. We are saved by grace through faith. We know that if we trust God and refuse to let go of God, irrespective of what the devil may throw at us, God is still faithful. The sanctuary service shows us that in the end of all of this, God is vindicated. God's people triumph and ultimately dwell in a place where there is no sin, no sadness, no sorrow, no suffering, and everything works out right. Evil isn't going to triumph. You look around the world, you think evil already got a mortgage on everything. Evil is one. I've got an idea that we haven't seen anything yet. But Jesus is going to come back one day and we'll be triumphant with him. I wonder if you would please turn with me in your Bible to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 8. The book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 8. And as you turn to Daniel 8, I wonder if you can multitask uh, and listen to a quote that I'm going to read to you. This, this little quotation comes from, comes from a book I learned to love very quickly, a book that changed my life. The book is called The Great Controversy. And I read that book, and on the strength of meeting Jesus in that book, I became a Christian. Amen. And as I read that book, here's what, I, here's what I read. All who have received the light on these subjects are to bear testimony of the great truths which God has committed to them. The sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work in behalf of men. It concerns every living soul or every soul living upon the earth. It opens to view the plan of redemption, bringing us down to the very close of time and revealing the triumphant issue of the contest between righteousness and sin. It is of the utmost importance that all should thoroughly investigate these subjects and be able to give an answer to everyone that asketh them a reason of the hope that is in them. We ought to know something about this. We ought to be acquainted with this on, on, on some type of intimate level. We got to know that there's more than just something going on up there in heaven, but that Christ is engaged actively in the work of assuring and securing our salvation and changing our hearts and making them new and making us His totally and completely. We're in Daniel chapter 8. And verse 14. And in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, an angel says to the prophet Daniel, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be what? Cleansed. Now, so far as we've talked through these uh, sanctuary subjects, we, we've dealt kind of a lot with the idea that uh, a sinner would bring a lamb an offering down to the sanctuary, the lamb would die, blood would be shed, the sin would be transferred from the sinner to the animal and now in the blood of the dead animal and taken into the sanctuary where as it were it would, it would go on record in there if you like. And so the sin would be transferred into the sanctuary, into the sanctuary, into the sanctuary. The sinner is glad. He goes home saying, thank you God, I have been forgiven and I have been cleansed and I am made new and my sin isn't on me now. My sin is in there. That person rejoiced. But what about all that sin? It just collects, it collects, it collects, it collects. Got to do something about that sin. Oh yes, God said, I will do something about that sin. Each day throughout the year, 
the sins were transferred into the sanctuary. But at the last day of the year, the day of atonement, the day when God's people were truly declared to be at one with God, the day of at one meant special things took place there. Uh, let's get this in time before we talk just a little bit more about the, the special things that took place there. Daniel was told that the vision was for the time of the end. Now, now let's go over to Daniel chapter 9. You may well be familiar with these verses in Daniel chapter 9, but that's okay. We'll look at them and anchor something down, nail something down. We'll get our, our touch points all lined up here. In this part of the prophecy, uh, Daniel is told by the angel, Daniel 9 and verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon your people to, uh, and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make in reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy. 70 weeks is one year and four months. And all of this was going to happen in one year and four months. Not likely, because in prophecy, a day symbolically represents a what? A day for a year, a week, seven years. 70 weeks, 70 times seven, that's 490 years. Know therefore and understand that from, here's a beginning point, from the going forth of the commandment, to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be 69 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times and so forth. Daniel was given a beginning point for the great time prophecy of Daniel 9 and Daniel 8. The, the time when the command went forward. That one that talked about restoring and rebuilding Jerusalem. History would tell you, biblical history will point this out very clearly, that decree was issued in the year 457 B.C. 457 B.C. The issuing of that decree was the starting point for the 2,300 days or years. And if you do your math right, you get down to the year 1844. Now, you, you may have heard this. Um... Getting close to 200 years ago, there was a fine man, a, good, a man of God. He'd given his heart to Jesus. He really had. He was a, a preacher, a lay preacher. And his name was William Miller. Now, William Miller was a, was a church-going man, and he was a Baptist. He was a good Baptist. Now, there's a reason that I want you to know what church he went to. You'll find this out in a minute. William Miller looked at that prophecy about the 2,300 days. He said, the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. Well, I know what that means. That means that the earth is going to be cleansed with fire. That means Jesus is coming back. See? And he looked at that prophecy and he said, if I can only understand when the, the sanctuary will be cleansed, that will tell me when Jesus is coming back. And he did his math and he figured out that Jesus was coming back in 1843. And then when that didn't happen, he realized he'd made a mistake. There was no year zero. What a fundamental mistake to make. He was off by a year. They came back. They said, Jesus is coming back in 1844. Now, you know, there are certain churches that have been tagged with making a mistake about 1844, but I think we should all be honest and admit that that idea about Jesus coming back in 1844 was a good Baptist mistake. Is it fair to do that? All right. It, was a Baptist. it wasn't an Adventist mistake. Not a Seventh-day Adventist. There were no Seventh-day Adventists, but there were plenty of Baptists. And the Baptist Miller made a mistake. He believed Jesus was coming back in 1843 and then 1844, but he wasn't right about that. He was wrong. Good fellow, though, and God used his research as faulty as it was. I mean, he was right about the time prophecy, right about 457, right about 1844, but he got his event wrong. And in 1844, something began. The cleansing of the sanctuary began. Oh, wait a minute. What's that? We come back to what took place in the Day of Atonement. Way back then, on the Day of Atonement, the sin record was cleansed, expunged. And God's people rejoiced. You know, back then, they took the Day of Atonement seriously. I read where one Hebrew scholar called the Day of Atonement a crisis of confession and repentance. A crisis. They had to be at one with God then. Had to be. They sought God. 
They turned to the Lord. They amended their lives so that when the Day of Atonement was over, they knew that they were included among that joyous company of the redeemed who had security in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of course, they were looking forward to the advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, but you know what I'm saying. Now, in heaven, we understand that the sanctuary is being cleansed. In writing to the Hebrews, the Bible writer was very, very clear that what took place in the earthly sanctuary was a shadow of what went on in the heavenly sanctuary. So just like the earthly sanctuary would be cleansed, the heavenly sanctuary would be cleansed as well. You see, what God wants to do is not just take our sins and cast them behind His back, not just take our sins and put them in the depths of the sea, not just take our sins and separate them from us as far as the east is from the west. He wants to take our sins and blot them out. Gone. We're going to live one day in a world where there be no books filled with records of sins, where there'll be no uh, memory of misdeeds and wrongs that have been committed. We're going to live one day in a land that is fairer than day. And what God shows us in the sanctuary service is that He is interested in finality. It's going to be over one day. Over. Gone. I'm thrilled. I can think back on things I've done in my life and I wince and I recoil and I get embarrassed even when I'm on my own own and none of you all know about it and maybe you have the same experience but thank God one day it's gone sin gone there'll be no more guilt there'll be no more shame there won't be any embarrassment there won't be any separation from God it will all be gone sin record gone I've just got to praise the Lord for that now Satan hates the idea he hates it he does not want you to know that you can go to your high priest in heaven right now and have him take care of your sin issues. So he says, well, you know, let's build a substitute here. Let's have some earthly priests. And when I was this big, uh, maybe this big, I was encouraged to go to an earthly priest and tell the earthly priest about my sins. And there's just something unnatural about that. I think everybody who goes through that feels that discomfort that says, this just isn't right. I couldn't figure out why in the world I couldn't just go straight to God. If I need to confess something, God knows about it. He's the one I ought to apologize to. What am I doing going through a man? Couldn't figure that out. But you know, the Bible says that the devil raised up a system that cast the truth down to the ground. If there's one thing the devil does not want you to know, he does not want you to know that you can go with confidence to the throne of grace and find mercy and grace to help in time of need. He would like you to think that you ought to go through a middleman. He would like you to think that you've got to work your way back into God's good books. He would like you to think that it takes a sum of money or a pilgrimage or an offering left in front of a statue. He would like that. He hates the grace of God. He does not want us going straight to Jesus and having Christ take away our sins and give us new heart. He doesn't want that. And he does not want you to know that one day sin will be gone and you'll be separated from sin forever. He doesn't like that. The idea shakes the foundation of his kingdom. He hates it. Jesus said, he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. I say, praise the Lord. Christ said, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus said, oh no, don't be so hasty. Christ says, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let all who is a thirst come. Jesus says, I'm knocking on your door. Just open that door up, and I will come in and dine with you. You will dine with me. I'll help you up. Sit with me on my throne, just like I sit with my Father in His throne. Christ opens to that to us freely. Come to the sanctuary, He says. Meet me there and receive grace and mercy. Thank the Lord. That last day of the Hebrew year, Day of Atonement, high priest got involved. High priest got involved on the Day of Atonement. Now, there were some interesting things about the service on that day. They brought a couple of goats down to the sanctuary. A couple of goats. 
And after the priest had prepared himself and his family, the two goats were brought to the door of the sanctuary to determine which goat was used for which purpose. Because there were two goats. There was the Lord's goat, and then there was the scapegoat. The Lord's goat and the scapegoat. The Lord's goat was offered as a sin offering. You'll read about that in Leviticus chapter 16. I think verse 9 will tell you that straight out. Now we ought to notice carefully, only one goat functioned as a sin offering. Just one. There are people who understand what I would teach on this and they would say, that's not right. You are making this goat somehow a sin bearer, the scapegoat. Not true. Only one of those two goats functioned as a sin offering. The offering was for everybody. The sin wasn't actually confessed over the head of the Lord's goat. Bearing the blood of this goat, the priest passed into the most holy place. This was a goat that was offered as a sacrifice for sin. The second goat, the scapegoat, was different. Now the reason I want to talk about this is this is important. Because this is integral in God's plan to get rid of sin. To show us that he's going to get rid of sin. This will happen with finality and certainty. When the high priest had made an end, when the high priest had finished making atonement for the people and for the sanctuary, when that was done, over, done, atonement, done. He then symbolically bore all of the confessed sins of the congregation in his person. And he placed these sins symbolically on the head of the second goat. And that second goat was led away into the wilderness, into a land of separation. It wasn't sacrificed by the shedding of blood. If it talked about that in the scriptures, we might make the mistake of thinking, well, somehow this goat made an atonement for sin. But it did not. Now, undoubtedly, the goat perished out there in the wilderness, but God didn't make a big deal of that in case somebody said, oh, this was for atonement. It was not. The record of sin was eradicated through the act of sending the scapegoat into the wilderness. I don't want to sound vindictive here, but I'm, I'm kind of glad that in the end of all this, the devil gets his. Amen. I'm kind of glad about that. Everything that's gone wrong in my life, devil had a hand in. Now, I don't go for the devil made me do it. And sometimes we blame the devil when we should just be blaming ourselves. But sin originated with him. And everything that grows out and develops out of sin, you can trace all the way back to the devil who's the father of sin. I say, thank the Lord. That scapegoat represents Satan. And Satan went off into the wilderness where undoubtedly he would die, punished the goat, for the sins that Satan committed and the sins that he had or his part in all of the other sins that were committed. Ultimately, the devil pays for what he has done. No, we're not talking about atonement. We are talking about sin punishment. If you look in Ezekiel chapter 28, the word of God says that ultimately Satan is burned up and reduced to ashes. Here's what's being symbolized in Leviticus chapter 16 with the scapegoat. And thank God, the scapegoat, gone into the wilderness. Sin has gone with him. And the people around the sanctuary that day, on the Day of Atonement, they praised the Lord. They thanked God. Sin is gone. And they were free, free, free at last. The sinner has walked through the sanctuary now. In the courtyard where the lamb died, that's where justification took place. The sacrifice was made and accepted. And then the holy place experience, growing in the grace of God, growing up into Jesus, experiencing sanctification through Christ, the bread of life, through the oil of the Holy Spirit feeding the seven-branch candlestick, through the ministration of prayer and communication with God and the righteousness of Christ mingling with our prayers as they ascend towards God in heaven. And on that final day of the year, the high priest took the people of God, as it were, 
into the very presence of God, right into the throne room of God, the most holy place. The people were at one with God now. There was peace between the people and the law of God, if we can put it that way. God's law, its claims had been satisfied. God's mercy, I love the fact that in the throne room of heaven, the God of heaven dwells on the mercy seat. Mercy is the foundation of his throne. I've got to thank God for that. And when you get into that most holy place, it teaches you some things. It teaches you that when you're back in harmony with God, you are keeping the commandments of God. Somebody looked into his Bible one time and looked in Revelation 11:19, a picture of the throne room. It shows the Ark of the Covenant there, and therefore the Ten Commandments, of which the Ark of the Covenant was the repository. If the Ark is there, the commandments are there. If the commandments are there, then the commandments ought to be kept here. So when someone looks at the commandments and says, now there's a fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, that person is standing on solid rock when they decide to accept that commandment into their life. It's in heaven. It's in the throne room of God. God did not eradicate it from the Ten Commandments that are in His presence at this moment. God's people discovered that God's people living in the last days would be keeping the Ten Commandments of Almighty God. Uh, let me pick up on a point here. Do you know why God has called His last day church into existence? Do you know why? He has called His last day church into existence so that through His last day church, He can prepare a people who are ready to meet Jesus when He comes back. Now, I don't know if you can say that about too many churches in the world. God specially called a church into existence so that through that church, God could work to affix upon people the seal of the living God and not the mark of the beast. God has given his people an end time message. That message is a message that prepares people to meet their God. We look at the three angels' messages. Second angel's message, Babylon has fallen. I shouldn't have started there. I should have gone to the first angel's message. Fear God and give glory to him because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the seas and the fountains of waters. Complete surrender to God. Hearts open wide. Jesus moving into our lives. Babylon has fallen. Get out of confusion. Don't receive the mark of the beast. Message number three. You know, that, that, that message isn't about a, a, a specific day and time. That message is about leaning on God with your whole life. The whole world is going to wander after the beast. Who do you think you are to swim against that kind of tide? You can't do it, but with God's help, you're going to do it. Leaning on Him, you're going to do it. Trusting in Him, connected to Him, abiding in Him, things are going to work out okay. And if you are trusting, believing, leaning, and abiding, issues about days and behavior and right and wrong will be worked out in your life. We get too caught up in the little picture, we miss the big picture. Sanctuary, you, you get inside that sanctuary, it talks about your growth in Jesus. It talks, about, it talks about what we believe as a people. You know somebody said that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And so therefore there are some things we leave out and some things we want to put in. A friend of mine showed me this just the other day. You've, you've probably heard this already. When you look at the sanctuary, where were the unclean animals? Where were they? They were outside. Where were the clean animals? Courtyard. Now, now, after justification, though, and you started growing in sanctification, you got into the sanctuary. Where were the animals? Now, there weren't any animals. You got in there, and what did you have? Olive oil and bread. And then you progressed a little further on in the sanctuary. You got into the throne room of God, and what did you find there? Almonds and manna. That's it. So as you progress through the sanctuary, you see a sanctuary sanctifying influence taking place even when it comes to your diet. Is it okay to say that or is, or is that just a little bit too far to the right? It seems to be about as biblical to me as the day is long. God's people preparing to live in the day of atonement will remember. I shouldn't say preparing. I mean preparing to live in the sight of a holy God. They will, will recognize that during the year 
whenever the high priest dressed up, he put on these splendid vestments. He had on him a, a breastplate and it had beautiful jewels and stones in it. It's gorgeous. But on the Day of Atonement, what did he do with that? He laid it aside. And he dressed simply and plainly. I'm not suggesting that we all ought to do like the high priest and wear a plain linen smock everywhere we go. But on the Day of Atonement, God was getting through to his people the idea that even when it comes to how you appear, the attention is to be diverted to Jesus and not sucked up by you. And I know that's getting to be just a little too old-fashioned for a lot of God's people today, but God's an old-fashioned God. I mean, he, he's old and old-fashioned. And, and, and truth doesn't go out of style with Almighty God. What was right once is right forever with the Lord. See, that's something that, we, that maybe we forget. I don't know. Maybe you don't. But maybe it's forgotten sometimes. I, I read this in another book I like a lot. This little book was called Education. And the little statement said, Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. And then the author went on to say, Godliness, Godlikeness is the goal to be reached. That's a high ideal, isn't it? Godliness, Godlikeness is the goal to be reached. But there is nothing that God cannot do when, in your life when you yield your life fully and completely to Him. In fact, I read this somewhere and I liked it so much I remembered it. Listen to this. When we submit ourselves to Him, the heart is united with His heart. The will is merged in His will. The mind becomes one with his mind. Our thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. This is what it means to be clothed in his righteousness. Amen. Wow. That's what God can do. But remember what came first. When we submit ourselves to him. See, the sanctuary service was set up, but nobody was forced to go and participate. It was there taking place. You can have faith. You can bring your offering. You can buy in. Or you could leave town and go wander off any way you wanted to. You know, if you're on that television program and you get asked, who is the 16th president of the United States? And you're given some options. Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, John F. Kennedy, or Richard Nixon. You say, oh, I don't know, can I phone a friend? Yes, yes, you, call, you phone a friend. You can t tell a person if you want to, Richard Nixon. You can say that. Now, you'd be dead wrong, but you can say that. It's a free country. It might cost you a million dollars, but you can say what you want. Or you could say Abraham Lincoln, and you're on the track to, to winning all that dough. See, the sanctuary service was set up, and you have freedom of choice. God's not going to drag you over there. Make the offering. Repent of your sin. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. God demonstrated his goodness to us in a million different ways. And he said, there's the lamb. Believe. Here's the sanctuary service. Participate. I am a God of love. Why don't you trust? And we can choose to do so or we could choose not to do so, I suppose. But why would we choose not? If we consent God will do great things in our lives. He will separate us from our sin, and there will be finality. Now, I, I want to say this, lest somebody grab this thing by the wrong, the, the wrong end and come away thinking that heaven's judgment is bad news. We confess our sins, our sins go up. We confess our sins just like they went into the sanctuary. They go to, they go to Christ. Figuratively, obviously, I've never seen a curious service taking them up but the sins go to God that's what happens to them on the day of atonement during the investigative judgment something happens I got a sneaking suspicion there are some people who have a little too much fear when it comes to the investigative judgment I was coming out of early service in church one day and I said something to a dear saint and she said well pastor I hope I'm ready for Jesus when he comes back we had to stop right there and I had to help my sister understand that in our church we don't hope to be ready for too much. 
through faith in Christ, we plan, we expect to be ready when Jesus comes back. If Jesus is truly your Savior, and you're chewing your fingernails saying, man, I hope he saves me when I come back. When he comes back, you've got a very small Savior. But if you have cast your lot in with Christ, accepted him as your Lord and Savior, believed on him unto salvation, you say, great, when Jesus comes back, I'm rushing outside to meet him. Can't wait to see him when he comes back. Now, I read what Arnold Wallenkamp said about the investigative judgment. I want to share with you an idea that he, that he uh, wrote down here. He said that for some people, perhaps the term investigative judgment conveys the wrong idea. Hear him out. He said, if you say investigative judgment, well, people might think that investigative judgment is God judging, as in making decisions as to a person's destiny. And that's not really the case. You've got to listen with both ears now. Uh, Wallenkamp suggests that the word audit is a better word to use than judgment. And frankly, I think he's right. I'm not going to fault people who use the word judgment, but I like his, his um, explanation here. He says, what an audit of paid financial bills does, and you know when the auditor comes? The auditor is coming to make sure bills have been paid. That's what he's doing. The auditor isn't making financial decisions during the audit. The audit simply confirms what has taken place. That's what the audit does. So Dr. Wallenkamp says we could call the investigative judgment the pre-advent heavenly audit. And I understand this point. I get it entirely. I think it's fair comment. It conveys a good understanding. This investigative judgment, the audit that Dr. Wallenkamp is talking about, it's not a time when God's people are being judged as though new information has come to light. For instance, a person lives and dies. Investigative judgment takes place, and however the process works, they come to this guy. John Q. Citizen. All right, here's the record. It's not God sitting about with some angels or turning to Jesus and saying, well, what do you think we should do with this guy? What do you think? Hmm, let's consider. The decision has been made. God opens up the books, and before the angels of the universe... God looks and says, John Q. Citizen, trusted in Jesus. That's another one right there. Let's move on to the next page. He's looking to see what decision you made. And then he validates or, or rubber stamps the decision you have made. John Q. Citizen rejected Jesus. All right, we'll honor his decision. John Q. Citizen chose Christ as Lord and Savior and abided in Christ until the day he died. Hallelujah. Here's another one. Next. So when you live your life and you confront the end of your life, you don't have to sweat what Jesus going to find when he looks at my page in the investigative judgment. Jesus isn't sleuthing around looking for some dirt on you. Hmm, seems to have lived a good life. I wonder what we can find. They'll do that. They'll send private detectives tracking people down. Hmm, everybody thinks this politician lives such a good life. Let's find some dirt. You think Jesus is doing that in the investigative judgment? What? He's not that malicious or cynical. Jesus comes to you and says, did this person choose me or not? Yes? Beautiful. Looking forward to seeing that one in the resurrection. Next page. He's not saying, well, uh, they said, let's see if we can find something to trip that person up with. No, God's just auditing during the investigative judgment. He's going to honor the decisions that we've made. He's not looking for new information. He's omniscient. He doesn't need new information. He'll know who has accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. As Paul wrote to Timothy, the Lord knows who are his. Jesus said, I know my own and my own know me. Jesus said in John 5 and verse 24, and I read, He who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. If Christ is your Savior today, 
Praise the Lord. If you've surrendered your life to Him today, there is no worry in terms of an investigative judgment. This is just God doing what's got to be done for the benefit of the universe. I will make my most important point, even though I have just a fraction of time left. When Jesus came to this earth, He came for two reasons. One was important, and that was to save us from our sins. There's a reason that was more important. Much more important. And that was to demonstrate to the universe what the character of God was all about. Uh, Satan charged God with unfairness and unkindness. That's why he said, I ought to sit in that throne. You ought to follow me. Don't follow God. I can do a better job of being the God of this universe. He charged God with unfairness. He came down to, to the earth, did just the same thing with Adam and Eve. Oh, really? God said you can't eat that? For no, 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 no. He just knows that if you eat it, you'll be better off. And he, he is unfair and wants to keep you from being blessed. This liar tells the world, tornado tears through Oklahoma, act of God. Hang on a minute. Devil ought to be getting the credit for that. He is a liar. Jesus came to this earth, and that's why he said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He came here so we would know what the Father was like. And if you know what the Father's like, you're going to reach out to him and love him. Amen. The sanctuary service is not God trying to, trying to find, oh, I found a reason for you to be lost. Boom. It's not God the, what do you call those, exterminator, bug killer. This is God the lover of our souls. Looking for a looking. This one had faith. Thank God. This one chose Jesus. I'm so. Th Does God say thank God? I don't suppose so. This one had faith in Christ. Great. The sanctuary tells me that God is love. And Romans says there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. You choose Jesus today. If you are in Christ today, there is no condemnation. And we can be confident. In Japan, there is a city. Funny enough, the city is named Suwa. Suwa. And you'll know why that's funny in just a moment. They were paying for years to have their sewage hauled away. The sewage in Suwa. They had to pay to have it hauled away. And then they got a bright idea. They said, no, no, no. We'll save a whole pile of money. We will burn it up. We'll incinerate it. So they started incinerating the sewage. But you know what they discovered when they incinerated all the sewage? They found gold whole bunch of minerals in town and 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 they just when the sewage was all gone there was gold hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of gold they started with sewage ended up with gold God can take the mess that is our life and add his grace and add his goodness and the sanctuary shows us that when it's all done God will have brought us through as gold